So to highlight this topic of epilepsy in children, this is truly a multidisciplinary topic and really solving this issue has been important to understand that there is a, a significant role for surgery in epilepsy uh, and it's done as a team. And this is one of the real contributions for Rahil is that the, the work and assembly of the team was multidisciplinary and we hope to continue to grow that program. So Rahil, could you uh, give bring us up to date on this? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Dempsey. Well, good morning and thank you everyone for joining in. Um, I uh, will talk about some of the recent uh, developments in our service um, here at UW Madison, some of the successes, some of the challenges, and then also review some of our experiences in the actual treatment and evaluation of the cohorts of uh, patients that we've been working with. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, this time last year, uh, while we were uh, living through the thick of COVID, through a series of pediatric talks, I had reviewed some of the more basic principles of epilepsy evaluation. And um, today, building upon that, um, I will review some uh, additional essential principles of surgical evaluation using some uh, representative cases and illustrate the practical application of all the diagnostic modalities that we use. Um, I will also review some of the more practical aspects of program development, given that epilepsy management requires a multidisciplinary approach, um, some of the steps, some of the successes, and some of the challenges that we've been facing. Um, specifically focusing on children about two decades ago, the NIH um, importantly updated its treatment recommendation. Mind you, it's a recommendation, not a guideline for children. Uh, now stating that the goal should be no seizures and no side effects. This is important uh, because this indicates that surgical candidacy should be considered if uh, medical treatment was associated with significant side effects. In other words, you don't necessarily have to wait for a child um, to be medication refractory on multiple medications before evaluating them uh, for surgical treatment. And uh, building upon this further, the International uh, League Against Epilepsy further highlighted the urgency of uh, seeking surgical evaluation, especially given susceptibility of the developing brain. Uh, one key aspect of progressive epilepsy in children is this concept of development of epileptic encephalopathy. This is a significant problem more prevalent in young children um, where children develop progressive disabilities as a consequence of ongoing untreated or inadequately addressed epilepsy. And it therefore stands to reason that whenever you have a high epilepsy burden, you have extremely low psychometric um, scores um, on all measures. So there's a certain urgency in terms of uh, addressing this early and addressing this adequately, um, which, is, which is important to keep in mind. The goals of surgical evaluation have always remained the same. Firstly, identify where the seizures are coming from and then identify where the eloquent cortex is in relation to the seizure focus. Uh, traditionally and historically, uh, intracranial recordings were first started through Penfield at the MNI in Canada by recording acute intraoperative ECOG um, using subdural grids. These were the large craniotomies, big exposure, large subdural grids, and the surgical plan was typically formulated by identifying and delineating uh, the ECOG spikes, which were then used to remove uh, the susceptible region that was causing epilepsy. But we actually owe it to the French neurosurgeon, Tallyhawk, uh, who starting in the 1950s, um, formulated uh, this anatomical, electrical, clinical hypothesis, um, trying to understand how ictal patterns led to clinical symptoms and how that ties in with the patient-specific anatomical factors. 
they were the first ones, uh, him and his group were the first one who first developed the technique of targeted depth electrode implantation. And this was the first time that people actually started looking at the three dimensional nature of the epileptic discharges within the brain. That was in 1958. They published their first series, I think somewhere around the 1970s using 200 patients. And then for a long, long time, broadly speaking, and this is a bit of a generalization, but broadly speaking, the North American surgical practice was all geared towards subdual grids. And it was only within the last maybe five, but certainly no more than 10 years uh, that stereo EEG has gradually and now almost completely replaced phase two evaluation, uh, both in children and uh, adults. Surgical evaluation is uh, literally the last um, uh, uh, step in the overall continuum of cares. And when patients are first referred to us in neurosurgery, the first step is to formulate a localization hypothesis take the localization hypothesis that the neurology colleagues give to us, take into account the individual perspectives of each one of these diagnostic modalities. Meg looks at interictal data, SPEC looks at the uh, ictal hotspots right at the time that a child or an adult has a seizure. ECOG and HR4 high frequency oscillations look at different electrographic signatures. And then sometimes, though not always, you will have an MR target or an MR, um, or excuse me, an anatomical target uh, that may be an indicator of where the seizures are actually starting from. The um, um, sorry, I'm missing something here. Yeah, yeah. So. How do we practically translate all those principles into practice? And this is the step where programmatic development first comes into play. Uh, when we first started looking at our data, we found out that when we were taking patients from the initial assessment, when they were diagnosed with medication refractory epilepsy, all the way through treatment, it was taking us almost close to a year, uh, which uh, is obviously an extremely long period of time. The Reasons are manifold at multiple levels, and they're not unique to either our service or uh, for that matter, any center. At the clinical level, there are issues in terms of coordinating studies, backlogs and scheduling. Um, how do you make sure that everyone is ordering the appropriate studies in a uniform fashion? How do you establish a multidisciplinary consensus between the neurosurgeons, the neurologists, the neuropsychologists, the neuroradiologists? Um, all of whom which are required to come up with a final treatment plan. And then importantly, at the level of the patients and their families, uh, their cognitive biases for or against sur seeking surgical treatment, the difficulties they have in terms of accessing health care, and all those then compound, obviously, the financial cost of it, uh, of the whole treatment process. It takes a long time. Anytime a child is not doing well, the family is affected. Um, and the fact that it takes a long period of time obviously adds to the overall burden for the family. The first thing that we focused at uh, was developing what we now call as the Comprehensive Epilepsy Pre-Surgical Evaluation or CEP. Um, we are certainly one of the programs that is doing it. We're not the only one. Uh, there are a few, but certainly not every center has it. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit, but the idea that you should have a central coordinated uh, pathway where you bring patients in, do all the tests all at the same time um, in one hospital setting to get the most diagnostic yield from all the individual modalities. As you grow the service and you start to have more and more patients, um, how do you keep track of all the different uh, patients, especially in terms of where they are in terms of the diagnostic pathway? And uh, that's where that's where we advocated for, and uh, after a while, uh, managed to um, get an epilepsy navigator to work with us, uh, Jenny Leiter, who's absolutely terrific and 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 does a great job of putting it all together. And then through all these steps, we looked at our own experience here at AFCH, and then finally using these um, objective metrics to try and understand if you're actually making a difference in terms of improving care. 
how does this program uh, or problem, excuse me, align with organizational goals? Very well. Uh, so it should be quite easy, right? Because the hospital says every child should receive prompt and appropriate care with minimal discomfort and hardship. But the logistics of actually bringing this together are not in uh, significant. So this is um, the CEP pathway in its current formulation. It took us about two years between us and neurosurgery, neurology, neuroradiology, neuropsychology, nuclear medicine, and a few other services, including anesthesia, outpatient uh, sedation clinics, so on and so forth, to put it all together. But the idea that you could complete this entire comprehensive evaluation over a single visit, spanning somewhere between seven to 10 days, maybe sometimes up to two weeks, um, and complete all the diagnostics, obviously gets a huge buy-in from families. They come in, they get everything done. But as you can imagine, that. The institutional demands are quite significant, so you have to book EMU for one child for uh, this long period of time. Uh, for SPECT, for example, uh, you have to hold scanner time for several hours each day because you don't know when a child will actually seize. When a child seizes and gets an injection, uh, there's usually a 24-hour period during which the scan has to be done so that you can actually localize the ictal hotspot um, in, in, in the brain. And the usual way in which this works for most children in its present formulation is that they come in the first day, they get the PET scan and a functional MRI. The workflow is slightly different if they're, um, if they're old enough to tolerate this awake versus if they're young enough and need sedation, in which case, uh, instead of uh, awake and task fMRIs, we do resting state uh, fMRIs under sedation. The next day they get neuropsych evaluation, which is usually a good four to six hour process. Uh, high density EEG, the subsequent day uh, they get an anatomical MRI, then they get hooked up um, sometimes under sedation if it's a really young child, uh, so it's easier to put on the leads. And then they stay um, in the EMU for the subsequent uh, week, maybe an additional 10 days. Importantly, this is not a kitchen sink approach, so as to say, not every child gets this, and therefore we have different flavors of uh, this diagnostic pathway, depending on what is needed for a particular child, depending on what uh, specific problem that we are trying to address uh, based on their uh, baseline epileptiform uh, activity. So how has this worked for us? We've done quite well. Uh, the uh, once we implemented the CEPR um, evaluation um, uh, time frame has now shrunk almost half, uh, slightly longer than six months, but it's still um, um, it's 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 still quite long as compared to national standards, which is about three to four months, right? So it's a huge step in the right direction. And right now the main roadblock is just getting more children into um, into the diagnostic pathway with the main roadblocks being anesthesia time, EMU availability, EMU tech availability, space availability, and obviously scanner time from uh, radiology, nuclear medicine, uh, basically across the board. So the whole uh, diagnostic pathway has to scale up several fold. And this is uh, um, a good way of looking at the data. So we've shrunk uh, the time to surgery um, by uh, several fold. And paradoxically, uh, by reducing the processing time, we've actually created a higher backlog in the sense that we now have several patients who by this criterion are now waiting about six months to actually enter the pathway and then proceed through step one after which they will get to phase two and, um, and actually undergo the surgical implantation. So it's a work in proce uh, progress. We've been advocating for this um, and um, hopefully this will continue to improve over, over months and years to come. Another critical aspect of program development is improving access to surgery for epilepsy patients from outside the institution. So. We've formalized working relationships with um, regional epileptologists and neurologists who may have the professional background, but don't necessarily have the practical facilities to implement the surgical evaluation, especially in terms of the phase two evaluation. You 
always have to be mindful in emphasizing their role and input in the sense that you can't just take the patient away. And this is uh, a very slow iterative process where you build confidence by helping them undertake the evaluation, but also make sure that once the surgical steps are done, they go back uh, to their primary neurologist and continue their workup. It's been quite successful. And now I think we have uh, quite uh, formalized ways of uh, getting referrals through Marshfield and Rock, uh, for, uh, Rockford, excuse me, in Illinois, and, and certainly more so in the Green Bay area too. Um, paradoxically, with, um, uh, with the COVID outbreak, uh, we were able to work around the HIPAA restrictions that we had in sharing these WebEx conferences with outside neurologists. Uh, previously, we weren't allowed to because these were patients within UW versus providers outside UW. Not every HPI bit of information can be can be um, um, can be hidden from outside providers. But thankfully, with the more relaxed um, uh, rules and online conferences, we've been able to now participate um, through. Uh, external epileptologists and, and, and radiologists who are now sending in their referrals. So this has been working really well. And then also optimizing the workflow between our group in terms of um, coordinating clinic appointment times and such so that when patients come in, they see the neurosurgeon, which is obviously typically me, but then importantly, their own primary neurologist and sometimes um, also the neuropsychologist all in the same go. So these initial steps then eventually lead to surgical evaluation during phase two, which is when patients come in for their steroid implantation. And one important factor that we started looking at, uh, especially given this huge backlog in our EMU workflow is how long can you keep a child attached to electrode extensions in bed under 24 observation? And is there anything that we can do to reduce the duration of phase two monitoring? So. The two important metrics are time to capture seizure, which obviously helps us capture enough diagnostic information so that you can complete recording, remove the electrodes and send the child home. And then also importantly, the operative time that it actually takes to do the procedure, which um, has an impact on obviously length of anesthesia, which then has an impact on um, how long it takes a child to trigger a seizure, which is uh, what we want to capture during phase two. So we need to capture typical seizures. Children with epilepsy should seize when you stop their meds, but how do you actually implement this in a safe fashion? Right? So uh, the issues are what is the child's baseline seizure frequency? And importantly, if you trigger, if you're too aggressive with weaning meds before someone comes into the hospital, can you actually trigger sort of a safety event? So as to say, if someone goes into status or if they require an EMS visit or they, or they end up bouncing back to the emergency room or conversely, if the seizures get so bad that they have to be restarted on meds and then they go back to square one and then it further delays uh, their EMU processing time. So, Using the data that we actually collect during the phase one CEP evaluation, we can determine how long it takes a child to have a seizure and then use the same drug wean period during the steroid admission in order to reduce the wait time. And this has worked for us really well. Um, and this is obviously applicable more so for children who don't fre uh, frequently seize, excuse me. So this is a uh, duration in ours and our experience now is that the majority of our children will typically have the first seizure between day one and day two. And the majority of our uh, phase two implantations are completed within 72 hours. So this is huge. This is huge in the sense that it helps to reduce hospital stay, it helps to reduce cost for families. And then obviously, and hopefully helps us to improve the rate of uh, turnover in the EMU because that always tends to be a big roadblock in, in, in terms of the number of children who can come in uh, through phase two evaluation. How does this compare to outside um, uh, hospitals, so as to say, or national standards really well? So 
the time that it takes for children to seize, as I mentioned, is about somewhere between one to two days. Most of them end up completing the stereo EEG evaluation by about day four or so, which uh, which is significantly lower than what a lot of the other centers across the country is doing, are doing, excuse me. So this is this has been working really well, and hopefully in time to come, instead of being stuck with the roadblock of just doing a single stereo EEG every, every three to four weeks, we'll be able to ramp up the volume some more, especially with the backlog that's being created by children being stuck in the phase one step and not progressing to, to phase two evaluation. The second thing is how do we improve the implantation time, right? So uh, this is this is a big shout out to Wendell Lake with whom I started doing these uh, steroid uh, procedures when we first got the robot. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that when we were initially doing these procedures, we probably didn't know the difference between changing a doorknob and doing these implantations simply because the general experience has always been for most of us who completed training several years ago to do large craniotomies, large grids, subdural strips, um, sometimes in isolation or with the help of a, a grid. And it has only been in the last several years that the implementation of the ROSA and now there are a couple of other robotic approaches that help improve the efficiency of the process. Previously, uh, some centers were using uh, formal six vessel angiography, which were then merged uh, with uh, using dual C arms to help the stereotactic localization. And that workflow was not necessarily very intuitive to most centers. So this is really something that um, has been greatly facilitated with technology, which we now uh, maybe four or five years later take for granted. The entire workflow of deciding how to implant, where to implant, how to troubleshoot is it's not very formulaic. It's 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 very iterative. And this process of experiential learning is extremely important. And 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 by team tagging with Wendell, it's been possible to study how the adult cases go on and and and, and vice versa. And how has this helped? Well, there are some general guidelines that again come from the original sort of French school of thought, so as to say, and in, in terms of where the electrode should go in, but they don't necessarily translate into an actual implantation strategy for each single patient. So when we first started doing these cases uh, way uh, back, maybe in 2016 or so, when we didn't even have the ROSA, we were doing about at the most eight to 10 electrodes, maybe at the most 12 in a few cases, and it was taking us pretty much the entire day these were the uh, days of using the vertex arm. You move the vertex arm to each single position. You never ever got to the exact position. Even if you were off by a couple of millimeters, you then had to make a new trajectory. You drive to the new trajectory and it was pretty much like catching your tail 12 times over for a single case. And then over time, now we've been able to reduce the length of um, our cases significantly. Most of our cases now get done somewhere between two and three hours, even though the number of implantations now, especially for the pediatric cases, ranges somewhere between 14 to 18 electrodes. Right? So importantly, surgery is not meant to be a speed game, but I think the most important implication for this has been in terms of reducing anesthesia time, which greatly suppresses the time that it takes um, uh, for children to to uh, develop seizures, which is uh, which is why they've been admitted for phase two evaluation. And then secondly, which is a recurrent theme, hopefully by completing this uh, case in you know two or three hours versus like six to seven hours, we can incorporate more cases within a single stereo EG window within the EMU capability. And this is something that we've been working towards for the for the last several months um, and will continue to work towards so that we can reduce the um, the lag time that we currently have in our phase two evaluation. So is it safe um, by now over the last um, maybe three or four years taking out maybe one year for COVID when we weren't allowed to do uh, any epilepsy cases since they're all obviously elective. 
between maybe 30 odd pediatric cases, although I haven't included the adult cases here, uh, but specifically looking at the pediatric cases, we've only had two minor hemorrhages. Um, a minor hemorrhage is defined as something that's not symptomatic. In both these cases, this hemorrhage was either picked up uh, in one case on a post-op CT scan, even though the child had no symptoms. And the second instance, it was probably related more so to the electrode pullout uh, because the only way we discovered this was when they came back for their resection and there was a small asymptomatic hemorrhage along the tract of one of the previous electrodes. We haven't had any major hemorrhages. Major hemorrhages are obviously defined as something that um, causes you to cut short your phase two evaluation or which gives rise to symptom or which gives rise to uh, neurological deficit uh, that's permanent. So it's really safe. Uh, we've now formulated a very specific protocol um, based on a CTA study and MRI study. Um, and again, the experiential process of using the same approach again and again between the adult and pediatric cases has has really helped us make this uh, extremely safe for for children and adults. So when we start looking at our surgical option uh, outcomes, excuse me, it's helpful to divide them into those where children underwent resection with a curative intent and those that underwent uh, resection with a palliative uh, intent. This differentiation is important because if you or if you are able to localize accurately where the epileptogenic zone is, then obviously you want to make sure that the child is seizure free. And when we look at all our uh, surgical cases where a priori we as a group, so obviously myself and our epileptologists, uh, were on the same page in terms of um, being sure of where the seizure was coming from, where it was propagating, and whether it was safe to proceed with the resection. We've had great success in achieving angle class one outcome, which is obviously complete seizure freedom. And when you combine angle one and angle two, which is the differentiation versus angle three and four in worthwhile versus not worthwhile improvement, 90% um, of them have done really well. Um, this patient is actually someone uh, with tuberous sclerosis where we certainly thought we were going to cure him with, um, with a temporal lobectomy, but unfortunately with the additional tubers and additional um, locations, the child had breakthrough seizures. In all honesty, you have to include them in this uh, patients like that in this cohort because, again, a priori, you thought you had a good localization hypothesis despite the substrate, which indicates a higher risk for breakthrough seizures. And um, understandably, this child uh, unfortunately did not have a significant improvement, although he was marginally better than uh, than his baseline uh, seizures. So this is really good, and the way we use this data is that um, in our uh, clinical workflow, if patients complete phase one and phase two, and as I mentioned, if you're all on the same page and being confident of um, our understanding of where the epileptogenic zone is, we should be able to offer at the minimum somewhere between um, 60 to 80 percent, and thankfully, as our experience indicates, towards a higher extent of uh, or higher percentage of uh, seizure freedom in those patients. The other ones where we are able to localize, but we cannot offer because there's either overlap with eloquent cortex or um, the network is too wide and it's just not feasible to offer a resection, then the then the um, uh, approaches that we have to offer are either laser ablation, and and this is where I think some of the philosophical differences, so as to say, between different centers come in. A lot of places will um, offer laser ablation upfront um, to see if maybe that helps, and 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 then that's where the proportion of primary surgical resections versus laser ablations varies from place to place. Here, uh, and, and again, this is um, just a personal thought and maybe a group thought between how we've formulated our surgical plans. Um, typically, if we've been confident of where the seizures are coming from, we don't offer laser ablation 
even if the surgery involves a big incision and maybe it's painful and maybe they are here for longer than uh, what they need to be here for a laser ablation, which requires you know a three millimeter incision and home the next or the day after next. Uh, we've, we've we've usually advocated for surgical resection in those cases. Sure enough, as is expected, because these are not curative steps uh, for non-resective surgeries. About a third of them do better, but two thirds of them don't do a whole lot better and sometimes either come back uh, if they need to transition from laser ablation to neuromodulation, which is either a VNS or an RNS, or more recently with one older teenager or almost transitional patient, um, a DBS to, to, to help uh, control their seizures. So um, I'll uh, over the remaining time I'll um, review a few case examples that um, encapsulate some of the important principles of uh, epileptogenic zone identification and uh, resection. The first is the principle of whether you can actually resect eloquent cortex and does the presence and or overlap of eloquent cortex with the epileptogenic zone necessarily an, imp an impediment to uh, seizure focused resection. And again, this is where there's a fundamental difference in how patients like these would be approached if they were 52 year old versus 12 year old. Uh, so this is a 12 year old young girl who's had focal seizures ever since she was an infant. Um, yeah, she's had a prior history of what was probably a vascular insult, either perinatal or postnatally. She's right-handed, so presumed left side dominant, and sure enough, on an awake scan, uh, an, an awake uh, task fMRI scan, she does have um, language function there, but also has language function on the other side, so maybe she's co-dominant, but there's certainly as much, um, um, as much speech localization on the fMRI scan on the left side, on the culprit side, as it is on the right side. Uh, these are MEG spikes, which um, also uh, localize to the left side, but obviously the sum total of this information doesn't necessarily give you a surgical target to go after, which is which is why she um, underwent a steroid implantation. The steroid implantation showed ictal onset within um, the superior frontal gyrus, but there was extremely rapid spread. Uh, from the frontal region all the way posteriorly, but not extending up to uh, the motor cortex. Importantly, when we do um, bedside cortical stimulation, and this is where um, the second aim of phase two evaluation comes in, which is to identify where eloquent cortex is. Sure enough, as was consistent with the um, uh, with the awake functional MRI, she did have language function within the cortex, which we would have. Uh, deemed um, essential to be removed in order to achieve seizure freedom. So then the question is, uh, can and should someone be able to tolerate a dominant uh, left frontal lobectomy when there are clear seizures coming from there, but then there is also clear language function there? Do you take hope in the fact that uh, there is some codominance so that the right side would pick up function um, these are things that, again, have to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis, and we presented both options to the family, either doing a more limited resection, going around the speech area, obviously with the colliery that uh, if you're leaving tissue behind, there would be a higher rate of uh, seizure recurrence, but also advocating for the fact that we should perhaps do a complete resection, because importantly, the most important and consistent determinant of quality of life um, in these patients is always seizure freedom, not always the presence of a post-operative deficit. So she had a big frontal resection. Uh, we keep uh, the motor strip safe by uh, obviously mapping it and then uh, doing this train of five uh, protocol that's extremely helpful for inducing cortical motor evoked potential. And here you can see we pretty much removed everything from the frontal pole back to the motor strip uh, from the medial fox to all the way down to the lateral fissure, uh, staying right above the um, right above the um, uh, insular cortex. And um, she woke up well with some minor speech hesitancy, 
but that was hardly perceptible by the time she was home about a week out. And about two and a half years out, uh, she's had no significant language decrement and is completely seizure free. So um, again, this is a principle more applicable to children than it is to older patients where um, removal of eloquent cortex is justifiable if they're young enough with the hope that they would have enough plasticity in their system to help regain their function. Um, I'm going to skip over this function, uh, this um, case, which was uh, a similar case uh, regarding um, resection of eloquent cortex, and then talk about uh, the role of intracorticography. Um, so again, uh, this is where you are harnessing um, uh, the intraoperative electrocorticography to try and make sure that once you've removed the culprit epileptogenic zone, there's no residual cortex left behind that may be part of that secondary irritative zone that may then still have the independent potential to cause seizures. Right? So this is um, this is someone um, who's nine years old, um, has uh, behavioral arrest, has a lesion. The lesion is well localized. Uh, the lesion is close to speech area. It somewhat overlaps with um, uh, the MEG information and the high density also points, the high density EEG also points towards the same region. So we did a uh, stereo EEG implantation and sure enough, uh, both the interictal high frequency oscillations and a typical uh, seizure all localized towards the culprit um, lesion that was identifiable on the scan. But then um, because there was a broader zone uh, of what we call as irritative cortex in and around uh, the focal area. So these labels indicate where um, the actual lesion was. We decided to undertake ECOG. So you do baseline ECOG and then um, do a resection. And then after repeating the resection, sure enough, there is still irritative tissue, right? So um, there is unfortunately not a universal body of literature that uh, explains what you should be doing once you have residual cortex, but um, the question still remains if you leave behind irritative cortex, even though you've removed the primary lesion, there's probably a higher risk of seizure recurrence than if those um, uh, residual spikes were not to be present. So this is where ECOG uh, comes in to play and because there was residual cortex left behind that was responsible for leftover spikes, we removed uh, that additional region too. And then a repeat ECOG after that um, did not show any additional residual activity. And this is really where the intraoperative ECOG helps us define the limits of resection over and above what is defined by the lesion and or the stereo EG boundaries during phase two evaluation. And um, you know, about two or three years out, this child is doing really well um, without uh, without having any seizures. Um, the last principle that I'll talk about is the role of intraoperative imaging, and um, one of the most common reasons uh, for failure of uh, resection surgery is if you leave tissue behind. Now, if you have a mislocalized hypothesis, well, then you're in trouble from the get go. But hopefully, if you started off with a good localization hypothesis and you, if you have good phase two data, then if someone were to wake up with seizures after surgery, it's almost always because you've left tissue behind. Um, so how do you assess that? Especially because uh, most of the times the tissue that you're removing is not a cavernoma, it's not a, it's not a tumor, it's usually just um, normal cortex being removed with normal uh, with anatomical landmarks so as to say so there's good data from it uh, for, for for the role of intraoperative mri uh, in pediatric cases as there probably is even for uh, adult cases especially for example for low grade tumors um, so we've started doing that um, for the first two cases that i did almost five years now um, that uh, had trouble with breakthrough seizures, we had to go back again and remove more tissue. But since then, and, and these are just case, case examples of where, for example, you may have a localized lesion, but the resection is always above and beyond 
that uh, that initial sentinel lesion. Similarly, here where the lesion might be localized to the frontal pole, but the steroid helps identify um, larger areas that need to be removed to help achieve seizure freedom. So since those initial few cases, now having routinely used uh, an IMTROP MRI, uh, I think the reoperation rate for incomplete resection has been zero, uh, which, which is great. This is, however, easier said than done. You know, this is a shared resource. We shared it with, you know, colleagues, obviously in our department, also with radiology who likes to use it for outpatient scans. So there's always a big backlog in terms of getting cases into, into the intraop MRI scan, which certainly adds to uh, adds to some of the delays and in, in, in actually getting someone onto the schedule. Then also the case length, I think even on best days, uh, I usually find that it adds at least an hour and a half, sometimes even two hours to the overall length of case. So uh, that's that's certainly a factor, but it, it's it's been an absolutely important aspect of making sure that you're able to safely remove all what you need to remove and all what you've defined as part of the epileptogenic zone uh, to, to help uh, achieve seizure freedom. Um, I'm going to skip over the next few cases and and wrap up with um, uh, with 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 what is perhaps um, uh, the most important aspect of steroid evaluation. It certainly seems like these cases are quite um, uh, similar to each other, but it's extremely important to take in the principles that we've talked about, which is uh, utilizing this network model of epilepsy. There is the epileptogenic zone, the irritative zone, the seizure onset zone. How do those overlap with the functional zone? That together with the traditional anatomical, electrographic, clinical hypothesis, and then importantly, see how we can make use of all the different modalities uh, to help come uh, together in a coherent phase two plan, so as to say. And then eventually, once you have the phase two plan, what exactly do you need or what approach do you actually need to implement to help achieve seizure freedom? So importantly, uh, even though the title of the talk focuses on surgical evaluation, this is this is a huge team effort and uh, uh, there are lots of people who are involved. First and foremost, my absolutely amazing colleagues on the uh, pediatric uh, epilepsy uh, service uh, it started off with David Shu, and now we've multiplied to about five or six, um, and there might be an additional one coming. Colleagues in neuroradiology, neuropsychology, who've been extremely helpful in changing their workflows to help us adapt to this uh, coordinated CEP pathway. Um, Brian Harris, who's been an absolute amazing help in uh, doing and helping us with all the uh, motor mapping cases, uh, especially for some of the Orlandic epilepsy cases. Laura Mykor, who backs up the EMU capability um, and all the staff at, on, on P7, and uh, importantly, Jen, Jenny Leiter, who's been our epilepsy navigator, who's an absolute um, star and a huge part of this uh, service. Um, I'll stop here and I can take any questions if um, anyone has um, any. Brett Raheel, that's an outstanding program, outstanding work. I would like you to give me an idea because right now I can see that the phase one evaluations, one per month, are kind of the, the bottleneck here. What's the ideal number of patients you think you should be taking care of in a year for the patient, looking at the patient need? And I'm meeting with the administration about this this afternoon. What's the first step we need to have them focus on to try to allow more patients to be served? That That is certainly the bottleneck. So the bottleneck exists both at phase one, where now we have a six month waiting period. Uh, we should be at the minimum uh, translating from one to at least two patients in the CEP pathway. It doesn't sound much, but it obviously doubles the capacity and halves the waiting time. We'll take more if we can, uh, but I think realistically to do this in a graduated stepwise fashion, that's probably the next step. Uh, the same thing for um, for the surgical cases. Right now, we are restricted to one every three to four weeks because 
uh, I and Azam or Wendell have to take turns between the adult and the epilepsy uh, and the pediatric epilepsy uh, cases because, again, of uh, EMU uh, shortages. Uh, that should at least be halved. Also, uh, again, we are booking out into into six or uh, seven months out, which is uh, which is an absolute shame because sometimes patients just lose. Lose interest and 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 go elsewhere, which is uh, uh, which is an absolute waste of everyone's resources, uh, especially theirs. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'm on it. Let me, I'll get on this for them. Thank you. Ahil, this is great. Uh, thank you again. Um, my question. Well, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to tell everyone that this is not just a credit to Rahil's excellent clinical and surgical skills, but also an ability to work with other departments and uh, institutions that oftentimes don't align in terms of their goals or at least their timeline. So this is really uh, an outstanding organizational feat that you and, and with the help of David Chu have done. Uh, my question to you is if you had to project into the future five, 10 years from now, what what would you love to do? I mean, what technology would you love to have? Or what type of patients you think should be the next frontier? I think we, and by we, I mean I, not me personally, but across the country, we have a good handle on um, helping take care of patients who are resective candidates. I don't think that's where the advancements will come in. Uh, the children that we are still not able to address are children with extremely poor, um, poorly controlled epilepsy and epileptic encephalopathy, as we call it, you know, the so-called so lennox gestalt syndrome patients where we are using things like VNS, which don't really work. We do things like calisotomies, which work to some extent, but not for everyone. And I think that's probably where the sort of neuromodulation aspect of it comes in. Uh, those patients will unfortunately never be surgical resection candidates. And um, the modulation efforts have to be uh, directed at that cohort, which is actually way bigger than 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 this uh, smaller subset where um, we are able to provide greater relief, um, but they make up a smaller proportion of uh, of the overall population. Um, the technology limitation are things like um, um, you know battery life of implants, right? So if you put an RNS in a 60 year old, you might have to replace it maybe five or six times. If you put an RNS in a five year old, you'll be replacing it 20 times across his lifetime, which is just not doable, right? And maybe just like your iPhone, someone has to come up with a rechargeable RNS uh, system. Uh, same thing with uh, exploring the candidacy of things like DBS and uh, some of the other neuromodulation approaches. Thank you very much, Rayo. And thank you, everyone. Outstanding. Thank you very much.